Noah, I hope you understand that we're only involving you in this so that you can be the one who gets executed when the authorities find out. Sebastian was explaining to Ryman. It had been a few days since the Gargandua's return from Kokong, and the IEC press junket was buzzing hopeful news all over the sector. But scientists like Sebastian knew better than to have hope. He was focused on one thing and one thing only, not being executed by hegemony for dabbling with AI. You see, AI was a very illegal thing in 3rd century Perseus, and at least one member of Ryman's crew, it was Ra, had let slip that their discovery of Kokong had come because an AI had effectively told them about it. Whoever this whistleblower was, it was Ra. They had drawn the attention of hegemony to the whole IEC. Since I have mentioned hegemony a few times, I suppose I should tell you what they were. As it happens, an opportunity to do so is emerging as I speak, so let us return to the Gargandua's bridge and Ryman's telephonic chat with Sebastian. My friend, if anything, it is you who are being set up for a fall, Ryman explained. I'm acting in accordance with my parole officer's wishes, according to the certificate I have just had signed. His apartment gets humidified with ancient efficiency and I get a few more months knocked off the sentence. Everyone wins. Whereas you are being recorded speaking with a known criminal about known crimes, and we both know it's the academy ordering the whole kebab. Therefore, I will happily carry out your dirty work for scientific research purposes, and I will proudly have absolutely nothing to fear from the so-called authorities. With a loud bang, the Gargandua's power went out. <clears throat> Situation report, Ryman said amid the pitch darkness. I'll go downstairs and look out the window, Allison said. Moments later, she clanked to the floor. And uh, another situation report, Ryman asked. I am lying on the ground with Lieutenant Contreras attempting to constrict me with her body, Allison reported. I'll go to the window then, Ryman said quickly, deftly disengaging from the perilous situation. The power supply has been compromised. This ship will soon freeze in the horrid cold of space, Contreras was saying from roughly the same part of the darkness as Allison. We must huddle together to preserve warmth. Oh, that is clever, Allison remarked. Although, you're actually very cold, Mrs. Contreras. I'm not married, Contreras corrected her. In the darkness, Ryman felt that maybe this was directed towards him. His professional and scientific curiosity pertaining to the present circumstances was becoming something of a distraction. He imagined that Contreras would be very cold, being less human than the average Huddley, in character obviously, but also physique, for Tritachion employees were of the post-human persuasion, not that persuasion is required for corporate mandated upgrades. She might appear human and deceptively sleek and beautiful by design, but what was she on the inside? Ryman remembered not to think about Contreras' insides. He also imagined that Contreras was indeed unmarried, and felt compelled to settle upon this conclusion with no further evidence required. That left only the mystery of what would happen were he to join the huddle on the floor. Oh wait, wasn't there a mystery regarding why the power had been shut off in the first place? Bang! The room was suddenly illuminated by blinding flashlights, providing all outstanding answers immediately. Firstly, and most importantly, Allison and Contreras were balled up in a shape that provided a good mass-to-service area ratio. Secondly, Hegemony were now in the room. It would have been more satisfying if they burst in right as Ryman said he had nothing to fear from the authorities, however, life doesn't always work out like that, eh? So who were these intruders, and why were they prying Allison and Contreras apart with a long stick? Hegemony were like the police of the Perseus sector, and the military, and the judiciary, and the legislature, and… in fact we needn't invoke any theory of government here. Hegemony were the people who killed you if you didn't do what they say. They were the official government of all systems, being that they were a rehash of the human empire that established them, the domain this empire was called. Now, in the modern era, the majority of the stars and planets were independent of hegemony law because they had militaries of their own, and hence had some protection against the roaming, iron docking tubed fleets that enforced old imperial law. And indeed, one new law. Absolutely no AI stuff of any description was to be permitted. 
talking to them, seeing them, knowing about them. There was a sliding scale of severity for AI crimes, with a rough, short and difficult to slide scale of punishments to go with it. I.e. Bang 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 bang! Your estate shall be invoiced for the bullet costs, have a good day, citizen. A lot of the constant warfare, repression and piracy that plagued the Perseus sector was closely related to people not really liking hegemony. But hegemony had absolutely massive battle fleets with expertise in mincing down rebellions from the old masters in the human domain. A small sample of such a fleet was currently parked right outside the Gargandua, itself directly outside the Galatia Academy with its officers now getting directly inside the pockets, bags, nooks, crannies, ultra nooks, reverse crannies, and perhaps even hyper orify of the entire IEC crew. This isn't strictly necessary, Ryman said, pushing his pockets back into their holes and his feet back into their shoes. We cannot suffer the machines to live, a masked officer recited. Yes, well, usually we use that stick you knocked down over there to hold the door open since the thing's broken. That's how much we hate machines, you know, Ryman ranted. The officer looked to the door, back to Ryman, then nodded. If only he had a machine that detected sarcasm. Is this about those rumours of us meeting an AI in space? Because really it's tavern talk, bar babble, pub prattle, and I suppose I could go on, but perhaps you understand what I'm getting at, Ryman said. Of course you didn't meet an AI. You would be dead if you did, the officer said. You are absolutely correct, Ryman smiled. Then what the bloody hell is this all about then? Titanian exploded. Just the basic pleasantries, the officer said in a basically pleasant fashion. I would give you my business card, but cards too expensive these days, eh? Ryman said. There are few planets with surplus trees, Contreras said. That reminds me of Kokong. And to what do we owe this very pleasurable pleasure? Ryman asked. Oh, oh the debt, yes, there'll be a fair bit of it, but I think you might be able to pay it back, the officer said. Skipping the floundering, water-treading, miscommunications and repeated application of the stick to the Contreras Olympus nucleus, hegemony were here to help. And by help, I mean spy, scheme, solicit and perhaps even seduce. For the whole notion that the IEC might be less of a joke than previously assumed was starting to spread around the sector, as were the humidifiers and similar high-quality ancient goods. It was only natural that the official government, controlling at least 10% of its claimed territory and boasting at least 10% approval within it, should be at the forefront of this new and surprisingly PR-friendly venture. Oh, and as for why they burst in with the lights off and guns in everyone's faces, it was because generally in one's life it speeds up all kinds of business to burst into rooms with the lights off and guns in everyone's faces. In hegemony it was practically rude not to do so, as this would indicate you don't really have any urgent need to interrupt at all. Very rude. So yes, Ryman and co weren't really in trouble, quite yet anyway, ho ho ho. With these new guests, the IEC fleet was now replete with military meat, I mean might. A light carrier crawling with fighters, a destroyer broad-shouldered and brimming with loud cannons, and an eagle-class cruiser, a big, menacing khaki triangle bristling with danger. But enough about Lieutenant Titanian. These craft, and their own set of logistical hangers-on, fell in behind the Gargandua. Bodyguards, soldiers, pirate fodder. If Ryman hadn't already paid decent money to have Captain laser engraved into his door, he'd promote himself to a rank more fitting for his level of command. Although he understood, of course, that all this muscle had appeared free of charge because they were planning on ruining everything down the line to turn a quick buck. But what was Ryman supposed to say to that? Was there a single person in the IEC not trying to do the same? Before Kokong, there certainly wasn't. Now, perhaps the odd fool could be caught experiencing hope. Let's see what this next journey does to the Peace and Hope share price index. The fleet set sail for the destination Sebastian had warned of. It was a star named Zendance, and it was about as far out as any ship could go. Yes, nearly ten minutes away. I have mentioned before that hyperspace is a small place. This was by design. The reason human territory was divided into sectors was that a lot of work had to go into making a stable plane of hyperspace to cover that area. 
so while one was free to fly off outside the original bounds of the sector, the probability of them ever ending up in the reality they left from began to drop from its old reliable 99.9% to 0%, and into the negatives as you reach a point when one version of you makes it back and another simultaneously doesn't. If the two beings like this were to meet, it would obliterate the entire universe. But I'm sure that's unlikely, 0.1% chance at the most. And as all scientists know, events with a 0.1% chance to occur never occur. That's just maths, baby. Or was it baby maths? Being a very competent and professional crew, it is a surprise that the IEC ended up missing their destination and steering very close to the edge of their assigned hyperreality. The bit of the sector they'd been sent to was somewhere near the top of the Map of Linear Interstellar Existence Space, or Map of Lies for short. In this neck of hyperwoods, there was only a single star further from home than Zendance. That's where the IEC fleet absent-mindedly tumbled to, in a very cliffhangery fashion. It was called Carcassigan, and while simply turning around and taking 20 more seconds in the right direction was all they needed to do, intrigue abounded the moment they popped from the violet-ringed hyperhall. Still a very official and unfunny term, remember? A message, and it's in old Tinderin, Allison reported. I will add that Tinderin was the language of the Perseus Sector, with old Tinderin being what they called the slightly removed version spoken across the galaxy in the human domain. I have cleverly translated all their words into English for you, because it's the done thing. Do you deserve this? I cannot possibly say, in English. Foods, rare ores, and these are weights for metals and silicates over there, Ryman said as he read the message through. Looks like a shopping list, Allison said. Or a price list. Is this some travelling salesman's lost transmission or something? It's all loud and clear. It's coming from this solar system. Let's take a look. Allison worked her magic on the equipment at her disposal. She focused the do-whats, lowered the humdingers, and radically altered the telewobble roll angle. But don't get too excited. An image of a refreshing white-blue planet materialized on the main screen. This is the planet Wall. It is listed as an agricultural production world, in an advanced state of the terraforming process. Contreras read from her tripod. Agricultural? The whole thing's covered in ice, Ryman noted. It's very cold, but very fertile, Contreras said, her eyes drilling into Ryman's soul. Feeling he must say something, Ryman coughed. Maybe that was classed as saying something in Tinderin. Then he remembered that this planet was broadcasting genuine, non-cough words right that second. And where there was language, there was life, fleshy or superior. I mean, chemical or electronic. A course was set for said chemical and or electronic stimulus. Speaking of which, Contreras got to work analyzing the commodity prices blaring across the vacuum. These exchanges are extremely wide margin, she said once the fleet was orbiting well. They are charging so little for food that we must simply purchase all we can. All crew, remove your clothes and prepare for an assessment of value. Lieutenant Contreras, please return to your quarters and don't come back until you aren't like this, Ryman ordered. But we must make these exchanges without delay, Contreras said, looking him up and down. I uh, wasn't going to delay, Ryman mumbled. And so, with this horrid space flirting finally done with, there was indeed no delay in taking a cargo shuttle down to the signal source on the planet. The shuttle was laden with spare parts, time torpedo casings remarketed as plows, nice idea, Ra, and a few unattended laundry baskets. What some lost traveller could want with all this metal was quite a head-scratcher. What about a domain-era human city practically carved into the tundra by fuzzy walls of radiators all around it? An emerging market, Contreras would have said, if she wasn't on timeout for being a laissez-faire lecher. Instead, Ryman, Allison and Ra would be the ones to witness this ridiculous discovery. One cargo port landing pad was lit up for them already. There was plenty of speculation that this was a lost civilization, but I am giving it too much fanfare, as it would turn out to be not all that. Ancient city on a lost planet? It's not all that. Offering great prices on local fruits and vegetables? Okay, get in the car. And don't even pack the gas masks, because this place got breathable air, drinkable water, and public toilet infrastructure the ancients could be, and were, proud of. 
this city was almost entirely abandoned. We're at the stage where using the word abandoned when talking about places outside of the core worlds is like describing the taste of a beverage as wet. Still, this was a surprisingly unruined ruin. Credit for this was due to the band of scraggly folk who met with Ryman and company in the freight exchange. Ah, oh, you're not robots, a punkish woman said. Ryman was surprised enough that he looked down at his body just to check. She was right. No, and you're not supposed to be alive, he said back. Here's anyone. Where's the fleet? What fleet? <sighs> Are you from the Corps? Yeah, sorry. I don't believe it. How'd you find us? Took a wrong turn. Hey, wait a second. Did you know that in the core, they say everyone living on these planets is dead, and that the planets are all ruined anyway? Someone tried to ruin this place, that's for sure. Looks like you core folk got it wrong. That's a funny thing, isn't it? Do you think she's actually an AI? Ra whispered. Ryman was about to call him all kinds of names for this interruption, but he realized that little fail son might have a point. I'll tell you who we are, Ryman offered. We're explorers from the core, looking for signs of life out here. And here you are. I promise we mean no harm, even if it were the case that you were actually somewhat electronic. I'm not a bloody robot, the woman exploded. Ryman had touched a sore cable. We thought you were the robots, the ones from space that bring us our parts and tech, all this here. She gestured at a load of yellow crates stacked up in the freight exchange. It's food. Robots love food, they do. Do they now? And I suppose you don't need the food, seeing as you run on battery power, Ryman probed. They told me that people from the core are rude and can't be reasoned with, the woman said with a defeated shake of the head. Who told you that? Paying customers. Ah, I see. We actually did bring some things for barter. I'd like to taste this food that's so good even beings without any taste buds enjoy it. All right. Thing is, ah, oh, no, we'll be fine. The robots will sort you out, won't they? She issued the final question to the crew at her back, who silently rose their arms to make a forest of red jumpsuits. It seemed like this was a yes, or at least something that meant the IEC offering was brought out to be weighed on the freight scale. So do we really believe them, Captain? Ra asked as the IEC officers huddled off to the side. Not especially, Ryman said. I don't know what this business about selling food to robots is. Do you think by robots they mean AI? Allison asked. Allison, I do think that, Ryman nodded, giving her a pat on the shoulder. Further, I think it's strange that they would be A, buying food, and B, buying it from humans. AI working with humans in harmony? That's more illegal than, well, than us even being here. But when you see it, so matter of fact, in the flesh, I can't say it's not impossible. This city needs machines, tech. There must be farms still going, under glass perhaps. These survivors have actually got a pretty sweet deal going. Wouldn't you be worried about the AI killing you if they know you're here? What if they don't like your prices? Ra said. I would indeed be worried by that, but should I be? This rubbish must have been right under our noses for 200 bloody years, and by the looks of it, this little arrangement's more stable than half the civilization we're paying through the nose every tax bill to support. You pay tax, lol, Ra snarked. Ra, you haven't been paying tax. That's S-word, Allison insisted. Evasion isn't stealing, just like salvaging isn't stealing. It's what they want you to do. It's how you win. I'm telling Dad. Dad taught me to do it. For legal reasons, I note for the record that I cannot hear this conversation," Ryman disclaimed, not liking that Ra looked him in the eye when he said Dad. It had been a bad day for letting his crew look him in the eye. Perhaps a new regulation was in order. Well, aside from this, the business-like locals of Wall had carried out a trade of the spare parts, and indeed the spare clothes, for a load of factory-fresh transplutonic ingots worth a ridiculously large sum that would have Contreras on a high for days, and some crates of genuine well-grown naan bread. Vacuum sealed, just the way the AI liked it apparently. There was one box that stood out from the others. It was human-sized and had an outline of a human on it, and through a window in the front, one could make out the frosty image of a human. I wonder what it is, Allison mused. 
Ryman inquired and came back with the answer that it was something that belonged to them. Wishing to return to the ship, Ryman gave a thumbs up. Who knows how offensive that was on WAL, but it didn't matter anymore, as the cargo shuttle was shooting back up to the Gargandua. Cryogenically frozen, Ryman noted of the human cargo container. He looked very closely. No, it's not Calicor. Ah, oh, that would make total sense, Ra commented. If it had been him, we'd be like, whoa, so that's how he really died. Too bad. Not too bad, Lieutenant Olympus Mark II, because if the answer to his grand conspiracy was that he died because he offended a secret non bread dealer on the edge of known space, that wouldn't really be the payoff we need. He might have known the AI were buying bread and followed them, Allison said. Exactly right, Lieutenant Olympus Mark I, Ryman said. Allison made a silly face at Ra, who reeled away and expressed his frustration by slamming the big red button on the cryocrate. I am Chief Logistics Officer and I can inspect the cargo whenever I like, he quickly said before Ryman complained. Checkmate. He's going to be so happy we brought him back to life, Allison said. Let him meet his new family before we rule him out for antidepressants in the rations, shall we? Ryman said. Oh, so that means we're going to keep him? I imagine so, unless you wish to throw him from the ship as we go. No, you can't just do that to a person. We paid for him. That's the spirit. Although I am concerned that he might be a bomb. It's really hard to make a good first impression with you, isn't it, Noah? Captain... No, I mean because those people might not want us blabbing about them. They might know that Hegemony, who are, may I remind you, in orbit of this planet right now, thanks to us, will kill them for working with the AI. That's not going to be a problem, Ranger, a voice inside the cryocrate said. Ra was standing there gawping with what must have been pride. Open the bloody thing, Ryman actually had to say before Ra did so. Inside was, drumroll please, a human man, living, as of a moment ago, breathing. Completely naked, as the universe always intended. Whether the universe intended for the three IEC officers to be staring at this nudity? Well, such questions are the remit of the great religions. For us, we must concern ourselves with the practical questions. Who in the name of Luditale are you? Ryman asked. And what have you been eating to get like that? Ra added, noting the frozen man's favourable appearance despite the low temperatures. The man rose from the crate and vaulted out scattering sparkling crystals of cryomatter all over the place. A messenger of peace and hope, he said. Wonderful, that's what we are too, Alison said, finally managing to tear her gaze upwards to look the man in the eye. You ain't got nothing to worry about from those people down there yonder, the man said, pointing at the floor and hence lowering all gazes once again. Ryman decided to give him some of the unsold dirty laundry, during which the man went on to say, Those folks have a pact with the so-called higher beings. If you do them wrong, you're dead. Hell, if we even talk about ratting them out, the remnants will come with all their unholy power and send us to a place from which there is no escape. You're saying we don't need to worry about them killing us because they'll get someone else to kill us for them, Ryman tried to clarify. That's about the long and long of it sure thing, the man said. And how do you know all this? Looks like they weren't too kind to you. They did not appreciate the truth. The truth that all this technology is the death of us, and it'll damn well be the death of them. The man preached, striking a pose that tore his too small donated clothing. You're a ruddy lud, aren't you? Allison asked, immediately losing all interest in him. Ra scoffed and turned away. I am a follower of the Mighty Lord, and you friends have been spared a meeting with the demons he seeks to strike down. Count yourselves lucky. Don't worry about them, Ryman assured him. They can't count their own fingers, let alone luck. When did you come here? It was some years back. Hitched a ride with a grey-haired fella, wearing same clothes as you, come to think of it. Calicor. Heck of a name. Thanks for remembering it for me. A name that invoked pain, yet perseverance, great intellect, yet great darkness within. Yeah, he was a bastard, all right. Spent the whole flight kind of strangling himself in this weird... Do you know where he went after you last saw him? I left him with my brother. You see, he was working in the nearby system. Sentance? Damn, you know me better than I know myself. But that's saying little of anything. 
because I don't know myself better than I know the meaning of the words I'm saying, you know? I know exactly what you mean, Ryman said. There's that I'm going to kill you, you moronic insect tone again. Can you show us where he was working? I'd be positively delighted. Maybe my brother in Lud is still there. As for your man, I think he had a hankering to be someplace else. He had a secret he was keeping from me. He was researching AI, Alison blabbed under no pressure whatsoever. I think she was simply being friendly. Emphasis on the simply. You, then we cannot delay. We have to catch up to him and stop him, the man insisted. This time it's you reading my mind, my good friend, Ryman said. Allow me to find you some shoes and we shall head to the bridge of our ship. Shoes? Shoes? Y'all got a lot to learn about technology, the man said, appearing genuinely crestfallen. We are dirty, sullen creatures, my friend, as you'll see. But the tools of your enemy might be the very thing that breaks that enemy's armor, eh? Ryman said. He was an expert at dealing with Luddites, as you might imagine. In the Perseus sector, you had to be, because the average Luddite carried several guns and pamphlets packed with rhetoric imploring the liberal use of said guns on almost any occasion. You might argue that a gun is more technologically advanced than a shoe. However, to begin arguing over the fine details of Luddic whims leaves you vulnerable to becoming the leader of the 38,000th Luddite splinter sect who will fight to the death to defend the right to wear shoes while executing anyone caught smuggling an abacus into an accountant's office. Suffice to say, in the chaotic aftermath of the AI wars, it was easy to forget where exactly the whole problem with technology began and ended. Indeed, human toolmaking instinct itself was the result of some original sin, according to 73% of Luddic canons. So ma'am, I guess you have a name and stuff? Ra asked. He had guessed correctly. Name's Thor's Day. Picked it myself. What does it mean? Alison asked. It's my favorite day. Oh, which Thor's Day was it? Every Thor's Day. Every Thor's Day is a perfect day. Thing is, seems these days, it ain't been Thor's Day for a long time. Thor's Day, let's call him Thor, looked up at the ceiling as if it was a boundless sky vast yet still unable to fully contain his ennui. Or maybe he was looking at the spider in the corner, given how he was also licking his lips. We'll get to know him more later, because the first priority was to follow his tip, which happened to amount to doing what they were supposed to do in the first place. Makes work that more exciting when a mysterious stranger tips you off that it's a good idea, doesn't it? More management lessons you can only learn at the edge of space-time. Anyway, the shuttle got back to its bay in the Gargantua, and the crew were prepared for the short journey in a homeward direction, although Ryman preferred not to tell the crew where they were going, knowing it would probably bite him later if the little buggers expected such things all the time. As they began to accelerate away, Allison was on the task of scanning the planet to compile data for the official report. The results were a little too juicy, given the whole tell anyone about them and the AI will somehow know and kill you instantly vibe that Thor had been pushing. And who wouldn't believe something Thor told them? Ah heck, I'll tell you what she found, between you and me. You see, the place they'd visited wasn't the only city on the planet. A few others had also kept their radiator walls online to hold off the Ice Age. Now there was essentially an ongoing battle between alliances of survivor groups huddled in their decaying city rings, exploring colossal ruins of industry, and contending with passing visitors possessing far-reaching machine intelligence and unknown motives. The stories of this one planet were so fascinating, so vast, so gripping and twisty, that I hope you'll appreciate I'm telling you a completely different one instead. It means this Ryman Contreras space-flirting saga and all its attached rubbish is even more profound and important than all that. One day, you'll see that I am right. As captain, Ryman stepped in to censor all this intrigue. The cool planet stuff, not the sickening horny stuff. Makes you wish for a program of censorious castellans, doesn't it? Right, he sighed after uncurling from his keyboard. So the official story is that we found a 200-year-old band of survivors who made it this far because they found an ancient stock of vacuum-packed naan bread deep enough to last, say, 300 years, so no one needs to check back on them until then, and the planet's pretty much dead, ice age, not worth a look, nothing to see here, and so on. We'll tell the hegemony crew that we just looted some bodies and left a no-silly-billious sign to enforce the law while we're gone. 
Or let's say the cargo shuttle malfunctioned and we didn't go down at all. Good thing I didn't tell them where we were going in the first place, eh? I knew that would pay off. I think we'll be in the clear, as long as we all keep the story straight, alright? Any story worth telling is a story worth smelling, Thor added with profound grace. Thank you, Thor. Imagine the tech you'd need to smell text. Degenerate, eh? Ryman mocked. Thor frowned, then presented a piece of that naan bread, produced from large only knows where on his person. Write the report on the bread, Ra realized. Give them bread as proof, Allison clapped. This was what Thor actually meant, by the way. Unless, no, it was probably this one. One could even do both, which Ryman quickly clocked, upon which he commented, the first idea begets the other there, eh? No one reacted, and the bread was withdrawn. Ryman did not deserve to smell it, and whether that is a damning indictment or gushing praise, again, Lud only knows. Who's Lud? We really don't have time for that now. The point is, uh... <clears throat> the space adventure continues as the daring IEC fleet zips to the Zendance system, last known location of the missing AI researcher known to be up to no good, or was it too good? And a mysterious Luddic missionary apparently knows just where to find fresh answers. There we go, that's what's happened, now let's see what happens next.